The subjects for which we got the most letters and phone calls and res overall response on alternative views are the programs involving John Stockwell and the CIA and Gary Shaw regarding the Kennedy assassination. Well, hold on to your seats, folks. This is a special occasion because we have both of these gentlemen with us on alternative views. Gary Shaw, of course, is the author of Cover Up. He's been studying the Kennedy assassination for the last 25 years. And undoubtedly, you've seen our two previous or maybe three previous programs with Gary Shaw. John Stockwell, of course, was in the CIA for 13 years, got out, wrote his famous book, In Search of Enemies, and we've done, oh, I don't know, anywhere from 35 to 40 programs with John. Well, on alternative views now, we're going to look at the Kennedy assassination from the aspect of putting together, trying to put together the conspiracy to kill John Kennedy. In our previous programs, we've demolished the Warren Commission report, so we're not even going to deal with that t t today. But we're going to try to reassemble, if we can, the whole conspiracy, very complex operation, and then also look at the cover-up that took place, because that was quite an operation, too. There have also been a lot of books that have been written recently about the Kennedy assassination, and we're going to review those as well. So this, I, I don't want to take any more time with the introduction. I'm so excited about what we're going to be talking about. Well, Gary, let's begin with your thesis of what actually happened. Let's try to reconstruct step by step your analysis of how the assassination of John F. Kennedy took place that fateful day in Dallas. I don't know how long that's going to take us, Doug, but we'll, we'll try. Yeah, what are the different elements in this conspiracy? Basically, the different elements uh, in the conspiracy concern the politics of that day, John Kennedy's uh, movement in certain directions that were contrary in some aspects to almost every major force in America. And so, though he was a very popular president with the majority of the people, uh, he had made an awful lot of very powerful folks mad at him. And so uh, Texas was having its problems uh, from a, the Democratic Party standpoint, and they were divided, and so the president comes to Texas on a political trip, and they plan motorcades and so forth for him to meet the people and give speeches and try to m mend those party wounds. He arrives in Dallas and is, of course, assassinated, uh, we're told, by one lone individual. Anybody was, that was there, knew immediately that there were more than one gunman, mm -hmm. that there were several. In fact, we've got certain eyewitnesses that felt, felt like that uh, there was an automatic weapon being used. That's how forceful and how quickly the shots were being fired at the motorcade. So uh, what I did is exactly the opposite of what the Warren Commission uh, did not do, and that is take the evidence from that day that we had the, the physical evidence and uh, and try to make some sense of it and go backward from the scene of the crime and establish shooters, okay. placement of the shooters, gun directions, number of shots, etc. And in doing so, uh, it was real easy to determine that there were at least four primary gunmen, two to the president's front, right front, and remember in the motorcade, the clear side of the automobile is the right and the rear. They planned it perfectly. And so there were two shooters to the right front, two shooters to the right rear. Uh, the ones in the front were more on a level with the motorcade, the two in the rear were upward and above. This limited in the, the possibility of hurting people within the limousine, wounding others, in fact, uh, uh, to some extent. Go ahead. Uh, this was this would have required so much coordination, so much planning, that so many people would have to have been involved, of starting uh, um, even you know with the route that it was taken. That's correct. Whoever uh, designed the route either had to been involved in the conspiracy, or the p conspirators would have had to know the route sufficiently in advance to be able to plan it, and to be able to train, on a previous program you said you think they probably trained with mock-ups mm -hmm. and all of this. 
Now, can you give us an idea of how this might have taken place? Okay, I believe it's very simple. I, I think that not necessarily did they have to have the, uh, someone to plan the motorcade route. I think they knew in advance from people that they had contact with the direction that the motorcade would take. And from that, they were able to plan the best possible site for it. They chose this site, and they practiced with it. Uh, I think they built a mock-up. They, they had their two kill zones. Okay, this is the kill zone A. I call this gunman number one and gunman number two. That's a triangulation of gunfire. Very strategically located. Let's see, a point one, is that on top of on the On top of the school book depository. Oh, okay. Okay. This is the uh, final two shots that hit the president. This is in kill zone B, or the sixth set of road stripes, and comes from the southwesternly sixth floor window of the school book depository and from the picket fence just above the grassy knoll to the left. That's number three and number four. It's real important for us to take another look at the Zapruder film. This is the famous Abraham Zapruder film of the Kennedy assassination. The president is now hit in the back, and then while he's behind the sign, he's hit in the throat from the front. He's now grasping at his throat and trying to talk to his wife. And the fatal head shot. This is a blow up of that head shot. The president is hit, now he's trying to talk to his wife. And he receives the fatal head shot. The president's reaction to the headshot can be seen more clearly with these enlargements. Notice that as the president is struck by the fatal headshot, his body is driven violently backwards. And if you watch the Zapruder film, you see the president hit twice at one section of the street. He's hit again twice at a section, a second section. These just happen to coincide with the fourth set of road stripes numbering down from Houston Street on Elm to the sixth set of road stripes. Uh, that was pre-planned. They didn't have to try to follow him. Uh, when he came to that sixth set of road stripes, there's two gunmen that, that were already honed in right at that point. And uh, they didn't have to have much timing between the two because they knew where they were going to hit him. And um, they, uh, they fired. They did their job. The one thing you don't want to do if you're going to kill the President of the United States or any leader, is miss. And I think they had two teams, two shooters, shooting teams, and they very accurately did their job that day. How far ahead would an elaborate assassination like this have to have been planned and have the people contacted to do it and trained so that they would be able to do such an incredibly perfect job uh, when they when the time came uh, this is going to lead us into a slightly different related subject uh, inside the CIA you don't have a class on assassinations in training <laughs> you don't rehearse assassinations in fact they work very hard to convince you that the CIA doesn't do assassinations and then later on in your career as it happened with me you begin to learn that they do uh, but there is no book in the CIA or SOP or file or office that teaches assassinations. They would lose the magic of the CIA if there were, which is the plausible deniability of having so many employees who are slightly naive, good soldiers, who believe it's a clean organization. And then you compartment out things like the assassination and like the drug experimentation program and the disease uh, experimentation program. Uh, from my military background, putting it in terms of an ambush, see that puts, which I think it was, they planned it, they executed it like a military ambush. And this is what leads uh, me to the conclusion, and I think other researchers, in the direction of the, the shooting itself, having been planned, rehearsed, and executed uh, by principally the OP Mungu CI group in Florida that was training for raids into Cuba. They had the training facilities, uh, they had the expertise, they had combat experience in Cuba. And it, it, it doesn't ring to me like a mob hit. No. Uh, no. The, the execution of it was military. Uh, and then taking it from, from that, looking at it as a military ambush, 
uh, you could do it very quickly. You could do it in a couple of three weeks and do a good job of it if you have pros, seasoned pros. It seems to me, reading uh, the books and the history of what happened, they were probably working on the ambush itself for perhaps four months. They probably were mapping out where they were going to do it and setting up the mock-ups during the summer. That would be my guess. Okay, so that was just a part of the conspiracy. We have the Oswald factor and the uh, fake Oswald or the other Oswalds, how many ever Oswalds there were. Now some people believe that uh, Oswald was part of the conspiracy, people, some people say he wasn't, some people say he actually fired a shot, some say he didn't, but whether he did or not, the name and person Oswald or people Oswald was involved in a very careful planning it looked to me because we had Oswald showing up in Mexico City we had Oswald here uh, a man named Oswald um, going from Miami to Dallas in a caravan carrying uh, uh, rifles um, you mentioned in a previous program that a uh, uh, an international I think it was Swetra an international killer who also used the name of Oswald well, no, it was uh, a fellow from Texas, a young man from Texas that uh, okay. used the name Oswald in his gun running operations. Okay, to, that's to right. Cuban okay. Exiles, uh -huh. So there would have had to have been this planning ahead of time also, either to have Oswald as the patsy or to have all these other uh, various th ways to set up to uh, try to make somebody uh, the patsy. So what is your feeling on this aspect of a conspiracy? I think naturally um, in the, in the pre-planning of this thing, they had to have something that would throw the authorities off there in Dallas immediately. And uh, Oswald became convenient because of his background as having been uh, communist aligned. He, we went to Russia and renounced his citizenship and so forth, and he was a perfect one because, uh, let's face it, in the United States and in Texas, we're ready to hate uh, a little commie any day of the week, uh, you know. And so when they were able to pick up Oswald, and he had good background. He had already been working with the, uh, the Cuban exiles, we found out. Uh, he was also working as a pro-Castroite and passing out uh, fair play for Cuba uh, leaflets, etc. So he would seem like a cover-up itself. That's right. He's doing all of the staged. right things, yeah. and uh, his trip to Mexico is a mystery. It's still a mystery after 25 years, and uh, we still don't know what he was doing. We do know this. Again, the CIA, John, plays a, a particular role in this that I still don't understand. That is that they had cameras monitoring the Cuban embassy and the Russian embassy 24 hours a day, front and back doors. In Mexico City. In Mexico City. And uh, yet they were never able to produce photographs, and this was film work, you know. They, they produced photographs of other individuals and even a man who identified himself as Lee Henry Oswald, but never were they able to produce a photograph when asked about it, they said the camera happened to be broken the three days that he was there, you know. So uh, I, I don't know what to make of that. I do feel like if the, if the real Oswald had done what the Warren Commission and the CIA and the FBI, uh, FBI said that he did in Mexico City, that they would have had photographs and they would have pasted them on uh, the front of every newspaper in the world. And uh, because he was going down there again, wanting to go to Cuba, get a visa to go to Cuba so that he could go back to the USSR. But don't many people think that that was the other Oswald that went to Mexico City? That that was a, a dupe or a double? Again, you've got conflict. You've mm -hmm. got you've got his signature on hotel records that that handwriting experts say are his. Mm -hmm. You've got eyewitnesses saying that uh, the man that identified himself as Oswald. Uh, was not the man they saw, they saw shoot Jack Ruby on the television and whose picture appeared in the newspapers. So you've got, uh, again, those conflicts that uh, have never been reconciled, and we've not done it yet. Uh, I assume, is it possible that the, F uh, the CIA 
or even maybe the FBI, but the CIA has people who are so good at copying that they can sign somebody's name and it'll look exactly yeah. like, oh, I'm yes. sure they must have. <laughs> so oh, yes. to have a receipt with Oswald's uh, uh, name on it could fool an expert if somebody wanted well, to do that. Well, one right. possible scenario is that they sent Oswald down to Mexico City without him knowing what he was doing. They had some mm -hmm. operation he thought he was part of to get him in the hotels and have him That's witnessed true. in the scene. Then they have their other person go in pretending to be Oswald in the embassy and they don't uh, have any photographs. You know, conveniently, no, the cameras were broken that day. And so there's nothing uh, to disprove that it was Oswald who went into the embassy. Uh, what uh, what they came up with, though, that seemed to contradict it pretty flatly, was the testimony of the Cuban consul and the the people in the office who said, you know, as a, the guy was three inches taller and totally different build and appearance. Now, that's one possible scenario. Again, we can't uh, we can't prove it. Uh, the way I see this thing working, trying to make it uh, understandable to me as I knew the agency and the people in the halls who. Uh, people like myself and Ralph McGee, for example, would, Phil Litchkey, would never, you know, have remained in an organization that killed a president. I mean, we were, we were patriotic, you know, and we were supporting the system, and the president was the commander-in-chief. And yet the organization clearly was involved. So you think of it in terms of compartmentation. You have this group down in Florida, which is not inside the building, bureaucrats, you know, wearing coats and ties and shuffling papers. Um, pretty wild people, a lot of them Cuban exiles, and passionately involved, taking chances with their lives, uh, going into Cuba, uh, killing people, and blending smoothly into the mob activities into Cuba. And if they were the ones that did it, as appears to be the case, uh, they were quite compartmented from the activities in the building and all the rest of us. Then you start saying, well, how broad was the conspiracy? And I suggest that it could have worked this way. It wouldn't take that many people to actually plan and execute the killing, including uh, setting up Oswald as a, as a decoy, as a patsy. For the simple reason, if you take a total of 10 to 12 people there at the time of the ambush, uh, Jack Ruby undoubtedly involved in running errands working with them and maybe a couple of other people in New Orleans and Houston uh, directed by the OP Mongoose connections from Florida and you could do everything you know that I see having been done you do have to have some kind of cooperation from the Secret Service to, to detour the presidential convoy this might have been full complicity by the Secret Service or it might have been someone uh, led into it and a, and a gross lack of discipline uh, which we've seen the Secret Service manifest uh, many times uh, before in the past but w to make it work on a broader scale to cover up you had to have an atmosphere where a broad segment of the government and the mob had agreed that somebody ought to kill the bastard as you know they saw it and each segment that was involved in the cover-up had to have their own grievance against him, the president, which they did. So, one, they were hearing rumors that it was going to happen. Two, an atmosphere had been created where they condoned in advance that it would happen. It was okay to kill this president. They were kind of hungry for it to happen. So you have a relatively small group of people actually plan and execute the killing and a bunch of other people standing by and just automatically saying it's in our interest to work a cover-up on it. And they had been fed some essential ingredients that would make a cover-up possible on which to build a cover-up that seems to us in retrospect to have been pretty preposterous of a lone assassin. Mm -hmm. Very small police force with limited resources would in a serious investigation would have immediately have turned up a hundred things that were not consistent with a lone assassin. But just by throwing out the lone assassin, they were able to seize on that and build on that rather flagrantly, but successfully, to sell it to the public in such a way and, and establish the rest of the establishment so that no one was ever punished. But John, that sounds a lot like the book A Betrayal by Robert Morrow, in which he tries to reconstruct uh, as best he could. And he said that it was done with a renegade group of CIA people in conjunction with the Cuban exiles, but with the knowledge of the CIA up at the top who let it happen. It was done by these people, but someone up at the top had to know. 
But see, that doesn't mean the whole building or all 15,000 people had to know, but there had to be a thread going up to the top. And I've speculated a lot. You know, who? Who was the chain of command? How high does it go? Uh, a lot of things seem to indicate that Dick Helms probably uh, knew of it uh, and may have been involved in the prior approvals and planning. Or he may have been sitting there knowing, sensing that it was going on, but in the sense, you do a lot of things in the CIA without spelling it out to headquarters. They teach you to do that, what you don't put in writing. And the whole science of being a chief of station is to know what they want done and to make it happen, but without forcing them to say yes or no. And of course where it gets tricky is if you misread them and do something they don't want done, you can wreck your whole career. So that's the subtlety of that business. So you could have these people in Florida are planning this thing, Helms knowing that it was going to happen, but no one having put him you know, on, on the, the spot where he would have to say yes or no or sign something. And then it happens, he clearly participated in the cover-up. Mm -hmm. How high was Helms at that? Was he director at that time in the Deputy CIA? Deputy director. Deputy director. Deputy director. In our previous programs, you indicated that you thought there were some foreign professional assassins, particularly Frenchmen, involved in this, or a Frenchman. Now, that they brought in to do the job, and then they got him out the next day. Mm -hmm. Now, is this, how does this coincide with, with John's thesis that it was the Cuban exiles and their operation there? Yeah. Among this conglomerate, this group of people that were participating and being trained by the CIA were mercenaries or soldiers of fortune from, from the corners of the world. Oh. And it was not unusual to find Frenchmen, Belgians, uh, mercenaries, and so forth. And so it would not surprise me if you're going to kill the most important man in the world at that time. And I see him as that. Uh, I think you would get the best trained men available. And it does not surprise me that the evidence leads toward some French mercenaries being, being used in this operation. Um, I, I, I don't have any great problem with that, but I don't think that they ne necessarily had to have brought in a full team of shooters from Marseille uh, for the simple reason they had some very passionate people right on their own staffs. I could visualize a scene uh, where some of the people like Orlando Bosch was saying, I want to shoot, mm -hmm. you know, I want one of the rifles, and maybe some of the others, but they might have had a professional or two brought in, you know, as the nucleus of the thing. Is there a mafia connection that's plausible to the two of you? It is to me, uh, simply because the mob was already operating within this, uh, this program. The Operation the Mongoose, Mongoose to the assassinate Operation Mongoose, and, and they had taken two of uh, your higher-ranking Mafia figures, Johnny Roselli and Sam Giancana. The Kennedys had gone after them. That's right. The, the mob's, one of its big bases of operations was in Havana before the revolution. And Fidel was cutting all that off, severing the ties of nationalizing the gambling casinos that had belonged to Traficante and other uh, mob figures. And so in the war, the efforts to kill Fidel had been begun by the mob before the CIA approached the mob and said, let's kill uh, Castro, for example. The mob operations and activities into Cuba were extensive, and this put them uh, shoulder to shoulder and piggybacking upon and working with the CIA's mongoose people into Cuba to, to some points where they, you know, it's almost indistinguishable, uh, you know, as to what, where does CIA activity stop and mob activity start vis-a-vis -vis the operations from Florida into Cuba. One example, it's not crystal clear, but it does make a point, is this David Ferry, the pilot, uh, who was clearly at times flying arms for the CIA, uh, also uh, allegedly flew Marcelo back from Guatemala, where Bobby Kennedy had had him thrown out of the country and he flew back in and apparently now the question is was Ferry on the mob payroll when he flew Marcelo back in or did the CIA <laughs> send him to get Marcelo and bring him back in but you take it another step of course the famous Jack Ruby whose, whose ties are so extensive this may have nothing to do with anything but in 1947 congressman Richard Nixon intervened when the Congress was investigating Jack Rubenstein in Chicago mm. and got him off from, from being investigated and he relocated to, to Dallas and became Jack Ruby. Nixon had extensive close uh, relationships with the Mafia. 
so close that I, according to the Playboy history of organized crime, the Secret Service had to say, hey, Richard, you better cool it. You can't keep going out on uh, yachts with these guys. <laughs> They're mafia. The yeah. people are going to start looking at this. <laughs> Clearly a, a liability in his presidency. Uh, getting into the detail, and there's several of these, these books that, are, that are, are out now where you can read uh, Contract on America particularly and some of the others about the mob activities in Dallas and how extensive they were. And bringing back to what we were talking about before, the setup, luring the president into the ambush, was the Secret Service involved? Uh, to my knowledge, we don't know. But we do know the Secret Service people out boozing it up until 5 in the morning, one of them, uh, in a nightclub that was owned by a friend of Jack Ruby's. The close, night before close, the assassination? Yeah, close friend. A close friend of Jack Ruby's, a place where Jack Ruby uh, ran, uh, uh, you know, visited and hung out. Same girls and worked there. Same girls mm -hmm. worked there. And they were there, some of them, until 2 or 3 in the morning and one until 5 in the morning. This was the President's Secret Service. Now again, it could just be a very, very dirty, sloppy Secret Service operation, and they're hungover, and that might explain alone some of their a very dubious, unprofessional conduct during the shooting. You know, basic rule, when the bullets start flying, you mash down on the accelerator and get out of there. And instead, the driver stopped and turned around and looked back for a while for some very precious seconds. Uh, that could just be people with, with heavy hangovers or it could be some corruption from the mob or maybe the mob's role was just take these people out and show them a good time and get them thoroughly drunk provide information also to Indeed. the um, CIA or whoever the hitmen were so you well, don't think the mob were part of the hit squad in other words it has more of a military CIA operation oh I think they overlapped right into it I see. yeah I think I think that the lines distinguishing from the mongoose people mm -hmm. and their activities and the mob activities in, in Florida, in New Orleans, uh, and Dallas through Ruby were probably indistinguishable. Ferry working for both, Jack Ruby working for both, indistinguishable. And you get into the question about how would they know what the route, exact route was. Well, you know, if, 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 uh, if they're boozing it up until 5 in the morning with Secret Service people, you can presume that the contact was very intimate and they knew a lot about what was happening. There's always been something that has um, not bothered me, but did uh, puzzle me a bit. How far ahead of time did Oswald take that uh, job at the school book depository? Hmm. About a month. It was about a month, a little over a month. A month. So mm -hmm. if he was part of the conspiracy, they would have had to know what the route was a month ahead of time, would they not, if they were going to plant him as the patsy? And I wonder even if they... If they uh, a trip was scheduled that far in advance. Yes, the trip was planned that far in advance, and uh, probably the motorcade uh, was on paper. And uh, the the one key ingredient there to uh, to knowing about the motorcade is Jack Ruby's close uh, relationship with the Dallas Police Department. Uh, he went as he pleased among them. They, they came to his club. They were treated royally. Uh, his girls were told to wine, dine, whatever they needed, and uh, to take care of them. Uh, that's the reason he was able on Friday night. We even have one witness now, a policeman whose office was right next door to where they were interrogating Oswald, who said that Jack Ruby on Friday night actually went into the office of Will Fritz where they were interrogating Oswald. Wow. We know he was at the police. We've got film of him. Uh, but that has never come out, and this is a reliable officer of that day who's now retired and says, I don't care, this needs to be known. The route then, was that uh, selected by the local police or the Secret Service, or selected by the local police and then approved by the Secret Service, because it was against uh, yes. all regulations. Basically, the record is this, that uh, the Secret Service were taken by Assistant Chief uh, Charles Batchelor at the time, who was in charge of the motorcade. Uh, when Batchelor got to Dealey Plaza, after driving the, the first part of the motorcade, and he said then, we hit Stimmons Freeway right up here, and it's right out to Market Hall. He did not tell the Secret Service that there would be a right-hand turn going down Houston 90 degree right hand turn and then that 120 degree angle turn down on Elm Street. He did not take him that far. So uh, you can speculate either that we don't want to know, don't tell us anything, or 
they were not told anything and they assumed that they would continue right on directly in Main Street and that Main Street, the street uh, tied into Stimmons Freeway. And once again, you could either say this is part of the conspiracy or this was part of the people who were incredibly incompetent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but you find this all the way through. So that, all the way through. <laughs> which leads me to ask a question about the FBI then. There seemed to be complicity with the FBI, um, particularly in the cover-up, but now as the conspiracy, uh, there were people flashing badges, Secret Service badges, FBI badges here and there. Maybe they were fake, maybe they weren't. But what was then the extent of the... FBI relationships. Uh, I've uh, heard uh, uh, people say that Oswald had relationships with the FBI and uh, Ruby, of course, had relationships. There was with the an FBI. early report that Oswald had uh, an informant status with the FBI. They had a, an informant number that he re received funds monthly. One of the Western Union people t um, testified to that fact and uh, that he received $200 a month. And his uh, informant number was like S-172. Uh, in other words, they get real specific. Now, what I have a tendency to believe is that probably another individual was this informant who was using the name Oswald uh -huh. and was working for the FBI. Mm -hmm. And so they could legitimately say Lee Harvey Oswald, the man who shot the president, was never an informant of ours. But this other man who was being used, and, and I think all of the evidence points to some type of either uh, bureau involvement or intelligence involvement, even if it's a low echelon involvement, of Lee Harvey Oswald. Every, I mean, it's like uh, Senator Schweiker said, the, the fingerprints of intelligence are on every move that he made back in that period of time. FBI or CIA? Or One or the other. Or, in, in or Defense in Intelligence Agency. We had a number of uh -huh. And uh, so uh, that's kind of the way I have approached it. It does not have to be. And the FBI had already destroyed a note, you know, that uh, the Oswald had brought up there. Well, uh, well, on Oswald, do you think he was a patsy or a participant? My yes. best guess is that he had absolutely nothing to do with the shooting that okay. day. I think the evidence would prove that out uh, in a court of law. Uh, that there was somebody in his place who looked very much like him, and it's even a good possibility that Oswald, acting on behalf of one of these agencies, had actually knew about the plot and perhaps had even tried to report it. Mark Lane gave a speech in which he said that when Oswald was informed that Kennedy had been shot, he said, so, and they were accusing him of doing it, he said, so I'm the patsy. Right. Now, which would lead me to believe that he was part of the conspiracy. He may not have fired, he may not have been at the school book depository and all, but uh, it, it leads you to think that he was part of the conspiracy. Or but part of something. John Davis wrote a, wrote a book called Mafia Kingfish. It'll be out in paperback in, in November, and I urge uh, uh, your viewers to, to buy it. But it, it does uh, make a very good case for Carlos Marcello as the, the force as one of the forces behind the assassination of the president. But he uncovered evidence that uh, Lee Harvey Oswald actually worked for the Marcello family in New Orleans. As a boy, as supposedly. A boy. Uh -huh, as a runner. And and his, his uncle did work for Marcello. Right. They know yeah. that, and he worked for his, for his uncle. And so that's a close tie with New Orleans and with David Ferry and with uh, uh, you know, organized crime. And uh, when it came time to to find somebody as this Patsy, he was a natural, which leads me to the conclusion that whoever his immediate superior, his case officer, or whoever it might be that, that directed his activities in whatever intelligence operation that he was in had to have also probably been in on the conspiracy to kill the president. And he was manipulating Lee Harvey Oswald into the position mm -hmm that he was. The job at the Texas School Book Depository, uh, his trip back to his rooming house where the Dallas police car while he's inside comes up and honks twice and he comes out and the last time the landlady sees him he's standing on the corner waiting on a bus and then the next thing you know uh, Tippett is killed and 
Oswald is way over here, and the, the timing is impossible for him to have done all of these mm -hmm. things, but he ends up in the theater with a gun, you know, and is arrested. The, the first two things the cops say to him, now here is a man miles from the scene of a crime. They have, have absolutely no indication that he's done anything other than allegedly sneak into a theater without paying. And they arrested him, and they're saying, shoot the president, will you? And we have eyewitnesses and ear witnesses testifying to that. That's what they were saying. Yeah. And even to the point of taking a gun butt and striking him with it. And right. at that point, they didn't have any of the reconstructions of the Warren Commission, which Absolutely turned out to be not. stretched and false. And so they had to have been all set up with the stories that Oswald was the person to go after and that he had killed the president and all that. Yeah, well, so now, were these people part of the conspiracy, or did somebody tip them off on the scene and say, okay, this there guy... There he is. Get him. Uh -huh. right. Well, I think, you know, this is speculation and can be discounted as such. Mm -hmm. But Oswald, when he saw what came down, immediately would do what I would do, what John would do, and he calls his superior and says, hey, this has happened, what's going on? And he says, I don't know, meet me at the Texas Theater, like we usually do, mm -hmm. or meet me at the Marseille uh, Zoo, uh, whatever they decide is a meeting place. And uh, then they hang up, he picks up the phone, he calls the authorities, uh, your man will be such and such place, such and such time. There is another aspect of the conspiracy which uh, either would have needed to be taken care of or as part of the cover-up, which we'll get into later, and that's the medical aspect. There were medical people all along the line, and there's one whole book written about it, that uh, destroyed evidence, tampered with evidence, uh, messed around with evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did they... Was this part of the conspiracy, too, that people had to have their... Uh, counterparts or people working with them in the medical flow of this from Dallas on up through Washington? I think there's no doubt that, uh, that there had to be and uh, I think it had to come basically from uh, from within uh, the, the White House. The one man who was key to all of this was uh, Admiral George Berkeley, the president's chief physician. He was with the president at Parkland Hospital. He was with him on Air Force One. Uh, he was with him at the at the autopsy, and he ordered the uh, autopsy surgeons at that uh, at that point not to do certain things, very valuable things, like not to probe the back wound so that they could determine its track and therefore the direction and uh, and angle of the of the shot not to probe the throat wound. Certain things had been done to the president's body. Uh, Henry Hurt, and this has gone uh, missed by, by most people, Henry Hurt called Dr. Berkeley, and Dr. Berkeley said, yes, there was a conspiracy. This, wow. was, this was in 1975. And he, he indicated that he would be willing to talk uh, to Mr. Hurt. When Mr. Hurt got back to him, he was very angry, very adamant, and said, I will not talk, forget I ever said anything. Wow. And uh, that is in his book, though, that, and he has got it on recording. His original statement is, yes, that there was a conspiracy. And it would have had to start right at Parkland Hospital, because that's where the magic bullet, the pristine bullet, that did all the damage, but came out with a, without a trace or a mark on it, that was found on a stretcher. So it had to have been, the medical aspect should have, would have had to start there as far as the cover-up goes. Well, it was a military-controlled uh, operation completely. And uh, I think you've got to ask yourself the question, if, uh, you know, if this happened, uh, how would uh, Robert Kennedy fit into this? Why would, why would he keep his mouth shut, uh, et cetera? And, uh, we learned probably about six or seven years ago that one of the first people that, that Robert Kennedy called was where one of the very top Cuban exile leaders, a fellow by the name of Harry Reese Williams. That's Harry R I R U I Z, I believe. Reese. Uh huh. Uh, Williams, and uh, he told him that hey, one of your guys uh, killed the president, and uh, that's not a pro-Castroite, that's an anti-Castroite. Uh, 
and you have to ask yourself, well, why didn't Robert do something about it? I think immediately they realized that the same group went to Dallas that they were sending to Cuba. And when they realized that and realized that those tracks would come right back to them, they had, they had to say, stop, we've got to cut this off now. And uh, they did do that. Now let's clarify that they, they in that case being they in that case Robert being Kennedy. Robert Kennedy, yeah. the uh, uh, people in uh, in the White House, Dr. Berkeley, orders directly to Dr. Berkeley. I think uh, J. Edgar Hoover and, and, uh, and uh, the Central Intelligence Agency had already seen what would happen if uh, if it, and so they they chose the lone assassin. The cover-up had to have begun before the assassination. Setting up Oswald as a patsy was prior planning, mm -hmm. and that that pristine bullet in the hospital, the bullet had to have been prepared, and someone had time. it there to drop it on site. Hoover apparently began to give orders the same day, you know, that they should focus on the lone assassin and you know prove he did it. So he was clearly poised to, to react in a certain way. He didn't have to take a couple of days to think about which way it was going to fall and take you know an expedient solution. He had a, a position on it. Uh, beginning immediately. Yeah. Now Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, uh, his position, it's, you know, he was disempowered in the moment the bullets started flying in Dallas to all practical purposes. His power was his brother, the president. His brother is killed. Johnson is the president. Bobby Kennedy lost his power base at that point. It seems to me he was obviously very bright and he'd been priding himself in playing hardball for a long time. He obviously knew the risks of this vendetta he was waging against organized crime. He must have thought about his own vulnerability uh, and his brothers. And it seems to me he immediately began, okay, get my head down and emerge eventually as president, and then I'll resume the fight with some muscle to make it happen. And this is the only way I can explain why he was so relatively quiet about what had happened. He knew he could be knocked off unless he became president and had the power to do something about it. The whole Kennedy family, including uh, John Kennedy's immediate family, bought the lone assassin thing. Well, no. they it, publicly they well, did. I, I really wonder say. if yeah. Robert yeah. did. I doubt it. I doubt it. You could not be an intelligent person and buy into that thing as it as it unfolded. No, I mean, but this is yeah. part of the cover up too. To, yeah. You know, put this face before the American people. Yeah. But before we get <laughs> into the cover up, I'm not sure we're going to have time to get into that. Maybe we'll have to wait till the next program for this. But getting back to this conspiracy, we're talking ab about an enormous, well planned conspiracy with people in the Secret Service, perhaps, in the medical uh, arenas, local police, the mob, the CIA, and the FBI. How was it possible, or maybe I'm just naive, how was it possible to conceive of and or to organize and coordinate such an enormous conspiracy which required so much coordination and good timing and security. I don't see it as having been a secure operation at all. There were leaks from top to bottom and sideways and all over the place. Uh, I think they, they used the sledgehammer approach to the thing. One, what made the cover-up work was this broad consensus by a huge and powerful segment of the government and the establishment that it would be okay to kill the president. So a team of people did it. Others knew it was going to happen. You know, a group went out and and did it. Who exactly up high ordered them to or just knew it was going to happen, uh, one can only speculate. But they started killing, assass uh, killing potential witnesses uh, very quickly, whistleblowers, uh, people who had different uh, contradictory uh, bits and pieces of the thing, very quickly. And the word gets out pretty fast if you're in a situation like that and witnesses are dying. Eventually, according to the High Treason book, they count 49 people that they name who were involved in one way or another who died violent or mysterious deaths. And then they allude to seven more here and seven more there. So a lot of people dying and the military putting its, for example, in the medical establishment, the autopsy, all of this done in, in military facilities, the military putting the word down that anyone who broke ranks and spoke out would be uh, courts-martialed. And then you have a, a certain complicity from the press. Lots of stuff published about it, but essentially the press eventually went along with the cover-up and began to feed and play and support the lone assassin theory. 
So it wasn't secure at all. There were people all over the place talking about it, but the establishment decided they were going to buy the cover-up and cooperate with it and kill people who, who could have blown it wide open. The Warren Commission, of course, was flagrant and heavy-handed, but in effect successful its selection of witnesses, for example, as it, as it reworked the evidence around the autopsy and the body, uh, not calling any of the nurses or doctors in Dallas to go up and testify and say where the wounds were and what the condition of the body was when they examined it, for example. This narrowed it down to fewer doctors that they could absolutely control that they could put on the stand and they could easily be intimidated. Some of them were quiet then and they've begun to speak out now and say this is not possible. What, in your best guess, is the scenario that happened? Who actually shot JFK and who actually was behind it? Basically, you go back to the politics of that day and, and John Kennedy was doing things in Cuba that had angered organized crime uh, to the extent that uh, he had made promises that they'd have uh, the Cubans would have Havana back, which meant the casinos would open back up, prostitution would flourish, the Las Vegas off the coast of Florida would be blossoming again, and narcotics traffic would have its easy flow, and, and uh, the, the good times would be back. He reneged on that promise. He reneged at the Bay of Pigs and alienated the Cuban exiles to the point of bitter hatred. You read books like Peter Wyden's Bay of Pigs, and and you see that they say if they'd had a gun and could have gotten to him, they'd have killed him that day, that the air support didn't come in uh, at the uh, Pigs Bay invasion. So uh, you see that little group, and you see that they have already got in operation an assassination apparatus. Uh, they have documented eight attempts on Fidel Castro from this CIA uh, group. Uh, Fidel Castro says there's 24, I think. And it's uh, curious that it only took one attempt for the President of the United it States. It only took they, one. They so you wonder how serious these attempts <laughs> really were. But uh, you, uh, you take that grouping right there, and when John Kennedy reneged on everything that he said after the missile crisis, uh, and uh, he promised that it, uh, uh, Khrushchev that there would be, never be an invasion of Cuba right. if they'd pull those uh, offensive missiles out then uh, the handwriting, I think, was on the wall at that time. And there was vengefulness involved, there was uh, money involved, there was power, and uh, that turned a, an apparatus that it was already trained and in, in operation uh, and turned it to, uh, to Dallas. I, I think you've got to remember that um, we don't protect or didn't protect our president at that time, like Fidel Castro was protected, yes. or like uh, Charles de Gaulle was protected, yes. and uh, it was, you know, it was a turkey shoot in Dallas. Yeah, the, the the attempts on Fidel's life were certainly serious, but you had a different uh, uh, operational problem, if you will, to try to do it in Cuba, where you did not have a broad consensus of it's okay to kill the man that you had in Dallas, that you had in the United States against Kennedy at that time. So they were having to plan a truly uh, clandestine assassination in which the, the shooter uh, wouldn't have some kind of magic immunity in a Warren Commission and whatnot. There would be an extremely vigilant reaction from Fidel's bodyguard and the Cuban government and whatnot. So they were trying to think of esoteric, clever, tricky ways to do it. In Dallas, God knows they could set up a big broad ambush right in <laughs> broad daylight and gun the man down. You have the, the killing apparently engineered by a, a paramilitary team, an ambush. Perhaps a small bunch of people with a few supporters in New Orleans and Dallas actually engineered the hit. Others knowing about it, but the cover-up uh, brings a lot of other very powerful and big groups into the, the, the conspiracy. And so then you get into motive, you know, why would the CIA be down on Kennedy enough to want to kill him? And you had, as Gary said, the Bay of Pigs, which they considered to be a betrayal. Objective readers in history would not necessarily agree, but they certainly did. And also he was in the pos policy of reformulating uh, the, the policies in Cuba uh, to actually withdraw and cut back and curtail the assassination attempts on Fidel and break up the O.P. Mongoose infrastructure that was raiding and attacking in Cuba. You get this in the Betrayal book by Bob Morrow, for example. 
Then you have the right-wing military that, that you see, the, you know, why did the military suppress the evidence and doctor the photographs and control the doctors? Uh, their anger could easily have been because, you know, a liberal president uh, pulling them back from with Vietnam, which was designated as their next big war. So the right-wing military, very angry about his, his position towards the world and towards war and towards their choice of wars. Again, the mob, uh, the Kennedy brothers were waging, especially Bobby, but with Jack's support, were waging a major vendetta against mob leaders. They had put Hoffa in jail. They had kicked Marcello out of the country, and then Rosselli and Giancani were incorporated into the activities. The mob had a fight for survival on its hands with the Kennedys. And, and uh, then, of course, you have their huge investment in Cuba, and then you also have linkage into Southeast Asia. Traficanti had been to visit Vietnam. They were obviously planning a shift in resources or, or the go to the Golden Triangle. If the U.S. went in in a big way, you'd have lots of vehicles, airplanes, and ships, literally, that you could piggyback the drugs back into the States, and Kennedy's pulling out of Southeast Asia. The, the Texas, the right-wing business folks, of course, the oil depletion allowances. Kennedy was cutting them. They had become fabulously rich from these things, and they didn't want them cut. Uh, and then you get, of course, the key uh, is the FBI. Not necessarily in the planning of the killing or the execution of the killing, but certainly Hoover's position, immediate position in the cover-up was essential to make it work. All of his agents trying to construct or ordered to try to construct evidence that would pinpoint a lone assassin. Some of them came up with bits and pieces that were quite contradictory, which the Warren Commission pretty much just ignored. So where did the FBI come up with its big grievance against Kennedy? And this is where you get into, a, for example, Contract on America, uh, David Scheim's book. Uh, Hoover had, and also this other excellent book, we have a copy here, Secrecy and Power, The Life of J. Edgar Hoover. Hoover had a lifetime association with organized crime. He bet and gambled, you know, weekly. It was his big passion, and he took two vacations a year regularly uh, where the bills were picked up by people who related to, to organized crime. And he maintained throughout that, uh, that organized crime was not a problem, not a factor in our society. It didn't exist. It didn't exist. Mm -hmm. No, the mafia didn't exist. The mafia, the mafia didn't, didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so he, he's in a position, if, you know, from that position and that history and that involvement, mm -hmm. his relationship with the mob, and then, of course, his, his hard right-wing stance, period, across the board, what you had all of these people faced with a very dynamic, effective, liberal president uh, who promised to be in office for four years and then four more years, quite possibly followed by his brother for four years and maybe four more years, and God knows, Teddy after that, I mean, <laughs> they could see a real dyna dynasty uh, moving. All the polls were showing that they had no chance whatsoever to win in the electoral process. And this is the reasoning where people come up and say it was a coup d'etat. This right-wing shadow government faced with, you know, each one with their, each element with their grievance against Kennedy, and this bottom underlying agreement that, that he was uh, a liberal, you know, doing everything wrong from their view of the world, uh, wanting to get rid of him. They couldn't wait for an election. They wouldn't win an election anyway. So the only way they could defend their interests would be to eliminate him. Thereby, uh, at the same time, establishing very clearly to subsequent presidents and senators and congresspeople about who really controls the power in this country and what the bottom line is when you start taking positions that could damage their interests. Well, we've talked about the conspiracy on our next program. We're going to talk about the cover-up and also some of the new books that have come out recently with John Stockwell and Gary Shaw will be with us. I can't wait for that one either. So stay with us for our next program. This is the second in our two-part series of our continuing series of studying the Kennedy assassination. Our last program was with John Stockwell, former CIA official, and Gary Shaw, author of Cover Up. Uh, we talked mainly about the nature of the conspiracy to kill John F. Kennedy, this very complex conspiracy that uh, took place. Well, on the program this time, we're going to talk mainly about the cover-up and how that has continued to today, until today. 
except on for a lot of books. And speaking of books, a lot of books have been written recently. We're going to review uh, some of these books. Who was actually involved in the cover-up and what steps did it take? The cover-up had to be uh, initiated early on. In other words, it had to be pre-planned. For instance, if you're going to plant cer certain evidence to, uh, to point the finger at, of guilt to a party or an individual, then that evidence needs to be manufactured ahead of time. And so probably this was done uh, when the site was chosen, the, the alleged patsy was, was chosen, and uh, uh, the modus operandi was, was all chosen and picked out and so forth. And early on they had done that. The cover-up actually went into to, uh, place at the time of the shooting and that uh, we find that uh, there's conflicting uh, testimony concerning the way the alleged sniper's nest appeared uh, at the time it was found and, and, uh, and later on. In fact, we have at least four and probably five official photographs of the sniper's nest, this sixth floor southeast corner of the school book depository, where the boxes are arranged in four different positions. We don't know today which is the right position because early on there was ch the changing of them. Uh, the uh, hulls from the rifle, the, the original um, officers that uh, saw the scene said that they were laid side by side there. Later on we get photographs and they're scattered like they would be if it was a bolt action rifle was used. So these things began early on and had to involve not all of the Dallas police, but maybe one member, uh, you know, or somebody in a position to manipulate this sort of thing. Somebody who had access to the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository was close to Oswald. Uh, and uh, later on, you know, this cover-up, uh, it had to go into to the upper echelons. Some of it, I think, was conspiratorial, pre-planning, and uh, went to the highest echelons of our government, and some of it was of expediency. Well, and, is it, you know, couldn't there be two aspects of the cover-up, or maybe two different cover-ups? One is the pre-planned conspiratorial cover-up. They knew they had to cover up evidence, medical, uh, ballistic, uh, other types of police-type uh, um, evidence. But then when you got to the higher level, of the Warren Commission, the mass media and all that. That was another cover-up that continues to today and that may be of, 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 a, of a different nature. A totally different so nature. We're, and that's what I mean by that cover-up yeah. by expediency and, I, and I'll talk about that. Well, but why don't I we talk I about bring the, out, yeah, the first, the okay. first one first then we'll talk about the one thing later. in particular I think is very important to remember in this that in all likelihood and again, this is speculation, but I think it's pretty sound speculation. In all likelihood, <clears throat> Oswald was never supposed to leave the Texas School Book Depository alive. Hmm. Had he not left alive, had he been killed there with the evidence already planted, he's dead, never can say a word, they kill the little commie rat, open and shut case. Isn't this typical uh, of... Uh operations of assassinations sure. where you have have somebody and he's the assassin sure, and then you kill him right it's quick. typical of mafia why why did he get out how could he have gotten out then that's an interesting obviously thing. he he didn't yeah. do as they s supposed he would do mm. or uh, you know and uh, when he did and he made contact with his with his principal and uh, so they had to you know they had to plan two or had to go into effect. Had Plan One done its job, we'd not we had not had the the extreme cover up that we've had to have because of it. Mm. And uh, that's a big. I think that's a big point. Uh, I had not really explored that before. But if he had been, they burst in on him and someone shoots him, and his body's there with the evidence in the window with a rifle. Uh, with the boxes, with the bullets, uh, then all of the confusion that must have caused them some anxiety wouldn't have been necessary. And the ruby and all the mysterious things that happen that can only be explained in terms of a damage control and a prolonged and 
increasingly sloppy conspiracy. Mm. Now, we talked about the cover-up of medical evidence in our previous program. We know from the two programs previous to that, which you did with us, of a lot of cover-up and destruction of evidence by local police and by the FBI. First, let's talk about the local police. What type of cover-up uh, occurred there? Yeah, I think uh, some of it, again, you would have to have somebody in a position to uh, be able to buy them, so to speak. Uh, I think there was cooperation, uh, for instance, in, in allowing Ruby to have full run uh, of uh, the police department and be able to get in the position in which to, to shoot Lee Harvey Oswald, to allow the evidence to be manufactured, to be altered, to be destroyed, and all of the things that happened. There had to be some complicity on the, on the part of that. Some of it also, I think, had to be by expediency. And what I mean by that, let's just say you're uh, Nick McDonald, for instance, and uh, you're a policeman that's, uh, you know, several years of service and uh, suddenly you're cast into the limelight because you're the one that goes into the theater and, and uh, you slap Oswald up beside the head and you're the man responsible for capturing the assassin of the President of the United States. Friend, I don't care what you found out after that. You're not going to tell anybody, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you want him to be guilty. You know, this is your moment in history. And I believe a lot of that took place. Also, if you go back and ask the policemen right now, which we have done, they'll tell you real quickly that they were told to shut up. <coughs> by whom? By their uh, superiors. By their superiors. And number two, uh, not only were they, they told to shut up, but the case was taken from the hands of the Dallas police authorities and transferred to the FBI, contrary to all laws of the land at that time. And how soon did the FBI come in to take over? Oh, they took over immediately, immediately, by and large, but but soon after. And, of course, one of the things we pointed out in 1976, and we have this from a firm report, that Captain Will Fritz, who was in charge of homicide and robbery and, and in charge of the interrogation of Oswald, is... Uh, in 1975, after uh, the Zapruder film had been shown for the first time on nationwide television, he's eating breakfast with his buddies the next day, and they're talking about it, and uh, he, he just almost stops in mid-bite, and he says, well, probably all of this is going to come out now. He said, but I'll tell you fellas, this is a group that he always ate with, I'll tell you guys, that when the president called me, we were investigating this crime, but when the president called me and told me I had my man, what could I do? By that he means Lyndon Johnson? By that he meant Lyndon Johnson. Lyndon Johnson himself called Will Fritz and told him <laughs> Lee Harvey Oswald did it. And, of course, that's what Hoover began to espouse immediately. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> now, the FBI was involved in destruction of evidence and manipulation of evidence, uh, tampering with evidence, and uh, they also had a hold of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald for a while, and they, as I understand it, they didn't even keep transcripts of their interrogation of Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, basically, the... The interrogation of Oswald came under Will Fritz, who was pretty well oh. renowned for his interrogation of, of prisoners. And, uh, but the FBI were sitting in on it, as I understand were other intelligence agents, Secret Service. And uh, Fritz made the statement that he kept no notes. That's real important. He kept no notes of the interrogation. Uh, he didn't say, I didn't take any. <laughs> he said, I kept no notes. Uh, but we've got statements from at least two people, including Oswald himself. When he was asked one time about a certain uh, thing, he says, I've already answered that. It's in your notes. Hmm. Read it for yourself. So we know that we, from him and from a, from a, a postal inspector by the name of, of uh, Harry Holmes, who was also present for what I, I don't know what a postal inspector is doing at an interrogation, but he was. Uh, who also mentioned the notes that were being kept. But uh, 
they've, they've never turned up. And so we don't know what Oswald was saying during, during the hours of his incarceration and before Jack Ruby shot him. But the Dallas police uh, were uh, not as derelict, I think, in, in the evidentiary s stages as was the, the uh, Federal Bureau of Investigation because some of what they did, uh, you know, I find hard to believe even now. Jerry, one of the big aspects of the cover-up has to do with this grassy knoll theory. The Zapruder film, many eyewitnesses immediately after the shooting said that they saw and heard smoke and bullets coming from the opposite end of Dealey Plaza from where uh, Oswald was supposedly shooting him. And the Zapruder film saw, saw Kennedy's head go in two directions. How did they cover up this grassy knoll theory? Who was responsible for that? Was that police, FBI, or how did this cover-up take place? Basically, it had to take place uh, in this way. The Warren Commission totally relied on the FBI, uh, some from the, from the uh, CIA and some from the Secret Service and other intelligence uh, agencies and investigative agencies. But basically, what the FBI fed them, that's what they used, uh, so that the FBI you know, completely, uh, you know, they they didn't say that there were no witnesses who said the shots, but there were no reliable reports of shots anywhere other than the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. Uh, one of the one of the funny things about that is is they publish steel frames, frame by frame, of the Zapruder film in the in the Warren Commission uh, volumes. When they get to frame number 312 and 313, which is the time of the president's fatal headshot, mm -hmm. then he takes and reverses those frames afterward. That way I say he, they are, they are reversed. Mm -hmm. And they're finally caught. And then they have the tendency, is what, what you do if you're following them, it has the tendency to completely negate the backward head movement mm -hmm. of the president upon being shot. That's in the Warren Commission report. That's in the Warren Commission I understand volumes. the... Uh, and he wrote a letter, of yeah. course, when they found it, and uh, said it was just a, a printing error. <laughs> uh, all of those frames, and that's the only two that are out of order. So oh, it's I, this kind of thing all the way through. I thought the FBI had done that. They doctored it up. And, and well, they were <clears> responsible for it. They were responsible. Uh -huh. But they also swallowed a lot of other evidence, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Okay, and the witnesses, they... Um, carefully doctored their use of witnesses right. too, didn't they? The, so the, they? the witnesses that they uh, they pushed toward the Warren Commission were those witnesses that buttressed uh, the buttress the, uh, mm -hmm. their report. Uh, you know, we we got tunnel vision. I admit that as a as a researcher and one who's found flaws in it. And uh, you know, we tend to tend to go in one direction. Uh, but I'm not as bad. I don't have the tunnel vision that they had and that they would completely ignore all of the... It's amazing the number of witnesses that said a shot was fired. Over 50 They were in Dealey Plaza in a position to hear and see said that the shot came from the president's right front and that kind of thing you, you can't ignore. Of course the biggest cover-up uh, right away was the Warren Commission and uh, that famous, that, that wonderful uh, memo from that was sent to, to them let's see now i always get that mixed up was it the press secretary sending it to or somebody sending yeah, it to it the was, press secretary can you yeah, quote that i love yeah. that yeah it was the uh, uh assistant attorney general oh that's right uh, nicholas katzenbach writing to uh, mr bill moyers who was new aide to uh, the new president lyndon johnson and he wrote that you know we must this is a paraphrase we must uh say Oswald was the lone assassin and that uh, we, we must not let the American people think that he's not. Right. In other words, we must have him right now in the press as convicted, tried and convicted, and no conspiracy exists, whether domestic or foreign. And we must, uh, we must uh, get the evidence together in such a way that there will be no, no other question. possibilities mm -hmm. and that this is the only possibility. Uh, well, it's so, funny. So that means the cover-up was immediate right up at the top. Now, why somebody had to make this decision that this had to be covered up immediately well, at I the think highest that, level? I think that had to come from the highest level. 
uh, when the Warren Commission came together, and this is just a little sideline, when they came together in their first uh, uh, initial meetings, the first thing they got was an outline and uh, a part of the outline, now this is before they've done any investigation, is Oswald as the assassin. That's one of the major breakdowns in their outline. They've already, before they've investigated and looked at the case, decided that they're going to, and here's all the items, the subheadings underneath their outline, as to why Oswald was the assassin. Mm -hmm. Now that had to come from the FBI, because they're doing it. They'd already I issued their interim report, and uh, supplementary report to that and said Oswald did it and did it alone. When the, when the committee came together, they, they made note of that. John, what, is, what are your feelings on this? It's one thing to have an assassination of, of a bunch of people getting together and, and killing the president, but then immediately at the highest levels of the government and the establishment, the Warren Commission was made up of people from the bedrock of the American political and economic establishment, John J. McCloy, Alan Dulles, etc. And these people immediately say, it's Oswald and that's it, and then they do all this big cover-up. Uh, what, what are they trying to cover up? Well, there's, there is no way that uh, a fair investigation could have been in fact conducted by the people that were on the Warren Commission. Yeah. Uh, President Johnson selected that committee obviously with great uh, advice and input. So you start with him. You know, we just said that it started with from the very top. The president's supposed to be at the very top. Uh, what did he have to gain and lose in terms of the Kennedy killing and the cover-up? Now, it is debated about whether or not he might have engineered it, you know, so he could become president and, and whatnot. I, I don't see that, really. No. But although God knows his political career was very, very <laughs> dirty, and there are some bodies lying around. But... Uh, also his ties with the mob, as apparently, if you read David Scheim's book, you know, many, if not most, of our top uh, political leaders have mob contacts. It may even be a situation where the mob has such muscle and influence that you can't really be a top leader without the connections with the mob, or at least a laissez-faire relationship with them. But in any case, Johnson, like the others we mentioned before, is faced with being permanently eclipsed by John Kennedy. Johnson wanted to be president. He could never become president as long as Kennedy was around. Uh, Kennedy's dead. He's president. I don't think he necessarily uh, engineered the killing, but he certainly benefited from it very greatly. He could have spent his entire presidency presiding over an investigation of the conspiracy to kill Kennedy, or he could get the thing behind him as quickly as possible and go on with his life and his presidency and his place in history. Now, as he did it, his place in history had to do with the great social revolution in the United States that he engineered, and the Vietnam War, which is tragedy that he engineered, uh, and it had very little to do with, uh, with the Kennedy killing, a cursory uh, sweep it under the, under the rug. Um, so he leaped immediately. He was obviously predisposed to leap upon the lone assassin, get the thing behind him, and go on with his life. You go to others, Alan Dulles, to put him on that committee, he was obviously a mortal enemy of John Kennedy. He was the person in the CIA, the famous director who really was responsible for the Bay of Pigs fiasco. Even to the detail of arranging to be in Puerto Rico giving a lecture when the landing happened so that he would have plausible deniability, which meant he wasn't there to persuade the president to do this or that. He was hiding out down in Puerto Rico. And he got fired. You know, his place in history, to mind you, he had been involved in the great manipulations uh, during and after World War II. He had a great sense of his own uh, role in history, behind the scenes perhaps, but nevertheless making and breaking presidents all over the world. And he's uh, fired by Kennedy in some humiliation at the end of his long and distinguished career. To put him on that commission, what chance are you going to have of him vigilantly investigating who killed the president, especially if some of his own former CIA people were involved, as they clearly were. Uh, Gerald Ford, others on the committee, were pro st strong historic uh, allies and protectors of the FBI. And as we said before, J. Edgar Hoover had a long lifetime association with organized crime. And uh, the FBI director who gave the orders to, to focus on the lone assassin. In some ways, if 
the cover-up seems so crass and flagrant, uh, and yet if you understand the workings of the government, they, they generally come up with party lines. Uh, I mean, the president or Henry Kissinger, when he dominated the government, would put out the word, and this is the policy, and everybody else, even if they knew it wasn't true, that was the line, and everybody sort of takes up on it. The admirals, the generals, that passed the word down in the Bethesda Medical Center and, and Walter Reed Hospital uh, that, you know, that people better not speak, they wouldn't have to be calling on the phone to the admiral, for example, saying, be sure that the autopsy is done this way and this way and this way to make the cover-up work. They wouldn't present it that way at all. They would be saying, look, we want to make sure that this loan assassin, they've already caught the killer. We want to make sure there are not a lot of wild rumors and people agitating around the nation. And Johnson gave them some useful cover stories. He said, if I investigate this thing r vigilantly, we may have to go to war with Russia, implying that the Russians might have done it. So the general is calling down to, to the admiral, to the people down below, saying, let's keep this thing under control. Let's be mature about it. They've already caught the killer. It's obviously this commie nut. Lee Harvey Oswald, and make sure everybody doesn't go hog wild and keep the lid on those doctors down there. I, want, I don't want them shooting off their mouths. And in a military establishment, <clears throat> with the discipline they have, that would be sufficient for a whole lot of people to say, aye, aye, sir, here's the word, yes, sir. And, let's, and then, of course, they had to have someone a little more cynical than that to manipulate the photographs. To, you know, to put hair in places where there wasn't hair before and cover up wounds that, uh, so they, I mean, they literally cut, it's in the high treason book of the, the head of the president. You can see where they added in, in effect, a toupee to cover up where the, the where wounds actually existed. Uh, this kind of thing, the whole government agreeing and then the establishment agreeing, the press agreeing. Okay, here's the line, this is the way it is, the president said. Uh, the Warren Commission said, and it all falls kind of naturally into place. Except in this case, I mean, they've done it hundreds and hundreds of times with lesser things, the necessity of our going into the Vietnam War. That blew up in their faces later on, but it worked for a while, and the nation marched off to war again. Uh, they did it very successfully with Ronald Reagan as he was president, trying to make him appear as a wise, uh, benign president when in fact he was mentally defective. He couldn't think straight. But they all agreed that he was the president and it was his policies and they packaged him and sold him to the country. Well, now there was a massive mass media cover-up in this too. Uh, they went right along with it. To this day, the establishment media say you were given the party line of the Warren Commission. Now, how could they have been uh, controlled and fit into this framework? Well, 80 percent of our news in this country is quoting the president or quoting some figure, quoting the Warren Commission. This is how they maintain power in the hands of the people in power, or are the voices, the spokespeople in, in power. The news is that in giving his speech today, President Bush said such and so. It's not considered to be good form to write, and he was lying through his teeth throughout the whole thing, and everybody was laughing and giggling because it couldn't possibly be true. No, the news story is the president said such and so, and then what he said. And then Senator so and so, and the Warren Commission, there was article after article, when the people on the commission itself were speaking out, and they were all saying, and J. Edgar Hoover's statements, and Bill Moyer's statements, and the Assistant Attorney General's statements, and all the others saying it's clearly a lone assassin. So the media is reporting that. Now, obviously, the media, one would dream that the media could take a more aggressive position and put big headlines saying flagrant cover-up of foot, people are lying all over the place. But the rules of journalism that the owners of the media have established are that that would be irresponsible journalism. This is where you get into the books, you know, manufacturing consent. Chomsky's book on the subject, or Inventing Reality, uh, uh, Michael Parenti's book on the subject, how they make believe, and they make the nation believe they're make believe. It's irresponsible journalism for the newspapers to take the lead and say what happened. They believe their role, or they maintain that their role, is to announce or to repeat to the public what the leaders say happened. On the editorial page, they obviously could do a better job. They would defend themselves, I'm quite <coughs> sure, by saying, oh, we ran lots of articles about other theories and other possibilities, and we ran lots of op-ed pieces expressing doubt about this, that, and the other, and they go back and show you the articles, but it still doesn't carry weight. 
until you get some front page story saying Senator so-and-so says this is a flagrant cover-up, Kennedy was killed, sloppy investigation, massive cover-up afoot, and, and the media didn't see its responsibility to do that. It saw its responsibility to participate in the cover story. There's another aspect of this, too, um, is that from my studies, if you look to see who the media moguls were at this time, and who the top people in the American power structure, you know, like the head of Chase Manhattan Bank, the head of Ford Foundation, the head of the CIA, you find that they are all interlocked with each other. They are involved in organizations such as the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderbergers. They are in a lot of the same elite social clubs. The head of the Time Life was a man who was a very important person at the top of the American power structures, uh, C.D. Jackson. So it would be very easy for these people to see each other informally or call each other up knowing each other and their attitudes on keeping control of the uh, government and the economic system. It would be very easy for them to coordinate, say, hey, the, we got to do this, and then they would just take it from there. Wayne Smith, you know, who's, who's a, a distinguished professor at Johns Hopkins, was formerly the State Department's representative in Cuba and resigned in 82 in protest of Reagan's policies. A lifetime career as a diplomat vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. and Cuba. And uh, not long ago, during the summer, when I was reading some of these books, he w we were talking on the phone. He said that their feeling back then, at the time of the killing, was that the nation was simply not ready for the awful truth, that the fabric of society couldn't uh, tolerate it, couldn't accept it. And, and then he said he wasn't sure they were necessarily wrong, given the circumstances back then. Although his position is that now enough time has gone by that w we should investigate. He would like to see a full, honest investigation at the pro present time. My answer to him, maybe I'm a purist. Maybe I'm still in a perverse way naive, as I was naive when the CIA was using me. But I don't buy that, even if it would tear the nation apart from top to bottom. If, that's what's n if you have such cynicism that they can kill the president and stuff it down the public's throat to cover up, and go on about their lives, then we need to tear the society apart from top to bottom and shake it apart and get some sense of law and order. What reality of order can there be in a society that is that cynical? You know uh, what? Oh, excuse me. Go ahead, John. Yeah. Well, I, he, he, you know, I, I said that, and he, he, he did not disagree with me. <laughs> He's certainly working now to get an investigation. But if someone like him would, would clearly understand their thinking back then. Well, it's, it's truly gruesome, but the nation just wouldn't be ready to deal with a cover-up that kills our president. Better to pull together and keep, you know, nationalism going and everything. Wow. I think every time I see the big dogs say something like that, I saw it during Watergate, etc. Oh, it'll tear this country apart if we have an investigation on What they're really saying is that the American people would find out too much about how the American political and economic system really work and who controls it and how and who benefits. And if this window were to open up and people were to see the way things really would happen, they would be quite angry. So in the Kennedy case, they would see how the CIA was operating, as Lyndon Johnson later said, a damn... Um, Murder Incorporated in the, in Latin America. They would see the relationships between the establishment people and the mob and organized crime and drugs. And they would see uh, these all of these unsavory things which the American people are not aware of. And if there were a true investigation of this, these things would come out. And they if might there, lose control. If there had been a true investigation of the Kennedy uh, killing, George Bush's policies today would be different, if he would be in office, in fact. Uh, his his double-sided cover story about a war on drugs, while his own personal and his own staff's involvement with major drug dealers, uh, he, of course, blithely ignores, and the major media blithely ignores, even though they have previously published these things, they've now agreed it's okay. What What's happening there, one can surmise, is a carryover to the Kennedy assassination is this is the mafia, after all, or forms of it that are smuggling the drugs, and you really are never going to go after them. 
you know, you don't want to get yourself bumped off. It's much better to play ball and all the balances take place, and that way you don't get yourself assassinated. In fact, there's even a more sinister aspect to this cover-up than we've gone into so far, and that is the amount of people that were killed or mysteriously died who were either involved in the conspiracy or had evidence and testimony that went against the lone assassin theory. Gary, when did the mysterious deaths, so to speak, begin with the cover-up? When did witnesses begin dying, let us say, under mysterious circumstances? And how broad did this mysterious death? Well, I think it probably had to start with Lee Oswald mm -hmm. in the basement <laughs> of the Dallas Police Department. I guess, right. And uh, it goes from there. Mm -hmm. It started immediately and uh, it continues even today. Uh, there's no way to put a number figure to it, but uh, you can, let's just take two or three, George DeMorin Shield, who was Oswald's best friend in Dallas, a very uh, influential uh, Russian immigrant and, and a very smart, intelligent uh, man, befriended the Oswalds. He had uh, French intelligence connections dating back into World War II. Did some very strange t things, had some strange connections to some very uh, high-ranking people. In fact, was in the uh, intelligence uh, agency headquarters in mid-1963 with a colonel and uh, a man from uh, down in Haiti, one of the very important bankers down there. But that's a story, uh, you know, a different story. Three hours before he was to uh, talk to a Senate investigator looking into the Kennedy assassination, uh, he had already made contact with him, set up the apartment. He takes a shotgun, puts it in his mouth, and blows his brains out. Uh, that's what we're told, and I'm uh, supposing that that's what happened. But uh, the key is it was because of the Kennedy assassination. Sam Giancana was one of these with uh, Operation Mongoose, one of the organized crime figures who had already w was telling the Senate and was being called before them one more time. and. Uh, Late in the night, uh, he is shot in, his, in the basement of his home as he's fixing a breakfast, obviously for himself and whoever this friend, quote unquote, <laughs> is that's there with him, who shoots him once in the back, and then, I understand, shoots him seven times in the mouth as he lays there dying, uh, meaning... Just to quiet. make his point. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. uh, Giancana's associate in this operation mongoose which was the castro assassination attempts mm -hmm. was a fellow by the name of john roselli you people have heard this story but but it's very important uh he's been talking about all of the things surrounding the castro uh attempts and the john kennedy assassination and suddenly he ends up uh, floating up out of uh, key biscayne florida and a 55 gallon drum He's been cut to pieces and stuffed into it and left there for dead. Uh, this goes on and on and on. There are eyewitnesses in yeah. Dealey Plaza to uh, Ruby Associates and uh, friends to organized crime figures to high CIA people. How and, many? How oh, many? I have no idea. It's, uh, you know, it's been calculated uh, by some to be in the 40s and 50s and by some on up in... Uh, past a hundred. Yeah, I don't think yeah. you can actually say. The High Treason book is one of the better recent books. Mm -hmm. Let's but talk about some of these recent books. Yeah, so. this, would, this would definitely be useful. This book, High Treason, by Robert Groden and Harrison Livingston, they list 49 people, as I count them. They don't have a number, but I went down and numbered. <laughs> if I didn't miss one, it was 49 by name, explaining what their association with uh, the killing, what, what they knew and the timing of their killing. And then they mention a couple places of seven here and seven there that also were killed without naming them. These 49 killings, as they describe them, they're imaginative, uh, all kinds of deaths, some of them apparently suicides, some of them improbable suicides, car crashes, shootings, bludgeonings, uh, you name it. Uh, they could be done by anyone. I see a lot of mob involvement, mm -hmm. but this is frankly because I know so much about the, the Jack Ruby's involvement in the killing and other mob figures in and around the killing and so you know the mob was there and then you think of these things yeah that sounds like the mob might very well have done that if it had been a killing uh, in a situation where there was no possible mob involvement 
I would not have felt uncomfortable in believing that these were engineered by people like the CIA's OP Mongoose people mm. or people working out of the Pentagon. Uh, there's nothing special about them. It's just different ways you can knock people off trying to keep it, well, I say trying to keep it from being too flagrant, but lots of them are very <laughs> flagrant. <laughs> Getting on to these books, you know, the, uh, we've got so many and such good ones coming out now, and it makes it... In 1980, reading Anthony Summers' book, uh, clearly you could only conclude from that that there was a conspiracy. What was the name of that book? Uh, uh, conspiracy. conspiracy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. His book, Conspiracy. <laughs> and he's, uh, he, he, but he pulls his punches, sort of, or he pulls up at the end. He won't deal with the killed witnesses, and, and he won't deal really with projecting as to who might have done the conspiracy, who was responsible for it, and under what circumstances. Now, there were some books out then. Uh, Gary's book, a cover-up, did deal with, you know, who might have done it, with the conspiracy, and uh, the conspiracy and the killing and the cover-up. Uh, we, we had a kind of a dearth for a while. Books coming out, there have been lots of books on the assassination, I'm sure. Oh, but yeah. major books coming out. Recently, we've had several come out that, that, that really bring a lot of this together in great detail. And just to mention these for the benefit of the, the viewers, uh, there's the book Best Evidence by David Lifton. And this one doesn't reach any conclusions, but it just goes meticulously over the evidence showing uh, all the discrepancies in the Warren Commission's uh, presentation of things. Very powerful without leading you anywhere uh, in, the, in, the, in the picture. This book, Reasonable Doubt by E. Hurt, you can show it to the camera, uh, the first half of this book I found to be just absolutely excellent as he presents the, the evidence in, in Dallas around the killing that could not fit a lone assassin theory. The second half of the book I felt like it drifts into things that are much less specific, a little harder to follow, uh, and thereby less uh, convincing. Just in the last year we have two books that have come out that are really quite fascinating, a little bit of unfortunate controversy around them, but they, they, even that may stimulate interest and make it worthwhile. But you have David Scheim's book, which presents the strong case. This is Contract on America, and it sold zillions of copies, fortunately. Zebra Press, published last year, uh, where he focuses on the extent of the mob's involvement in the killing, but also with top U.S. political leaders. Uh, this is an excellent book to get a vision of how much an influence and how vigorous and how energetic the mob is and was in that killing. Unfortunately, it's a weakness in his book, I think. He just doesn't deal with the CIA's presence very much in the killing. Now, we've corresponded with him since then, and it is not that he believes the CIA was not present. He does. But he was just investigating the mob's you know, involvement in it, and well, perhaps a better choice of wording, he might have said that. He might have come out and said, you know, the CIA was also involved, but I focused on the mob, and the mob overlaps into the CIA. This then, is, then you have the Garrison book, which goes the opposite and says it was the CIA and doesn't say much about the mob. And so Garrison's what? book is another excellent book. That's Jim Garrison uh, from New Orleans. He was the district attorney who investigated this thing, who, who engineered some, some uh, uh, the trial, tried to get people prosecuted, tried to prosecute Clay Shaw. Uh, himself was put on trial, uh, and both of those trials were, were futile. The people were not convicted, he or Shaw. And then evidence came out much later that he probably would have won his case if he had had the full evidence against Shaw that came out years after Shaw died, one of the 49 people. Uh, unfortunately, the controversy that surrounds Garrison is he was uh, flailed by the major media and lots of stories were circulated that he was associated with the mob. He was a district attorney in New Orleans where the mob ran things and had all the, Marcello had so much energy and control. And he's, of course, said that they were just out to get him because he was exposing their activities. Unfortunately, for his case, for his credibility, he has a shot in this book to clarify his position vis-a-vis -vis the mob. And he doesn't. Even in this book, when he had a chance to say, here's why I was not involved with the mob, uh, he, instead he says that Jack Ruby may have run some errands for the mob. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. And he says uh, at the end he pass brushes off mob involvement. At other times he said that in New Orleans he's found no evidence of Carlos Marcello running things or dominating things. 
And you could not be district attorney in New Orleans and not know of the extent of Marcello's activities. Maybe he doesn't so, want to be assassinated. Well, it could very well be. <laughs> and now, now, uh, Scheim, it gets a little stickier than that. Scheim writes in his book that Garrison has mob ties and has been seen having brother with Carlos Marcello's brothers. Having, having dinner, having oh. breakfast and dinner, sorry, <laughs> uh, with Car Carlos Marcello's brothers uh, after Marcello was in prison. And uh, this would, you know, imply an intimate, and also citing a time he went up country with them to some villa in Louisiana uh, to meet with them. Now, we've tracked this down and asked Scheim about his source on that, and he says his sources are impeccable, but they're anonymous. He can't reveal them for the evidence of, of Garrison dining with uh, the Marcello brothers. That's unfortunate because to make an assertion like that, it would be awfully nice if you had some documentation you could share with readers to help them judge, a photograph or something to help them judge, and he doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. So he's asking us to take it on faith that uh, he has uh, unimpeachable sources of that information. Uh, it, he, he nevertheless, I think these are two excellent books, but they're just looking at different parts of the elephant. One of them, showing the mob involvement, is, is just an excellent piece of work. And Garrison's book is fascinating, and his conclusions are very strong, although he just will not address the mob issue. This is what brings us to the, the, the best book that we have out recently, is High Treason by Robert Groden and Harrison Livingston, Conservatory Press, published in 1989. Uh, they put it all together. Mm. Now, they, they really try to beat it to death. They overwrite it. They make a point and then they repeat it five times to make it very clear what they're trying to say. And given all the obfuscation and confusion around the assassination, I find this effective in dealing with this subject. It's a, it's a well-written book to this purpose. And they put it all together. They show the mob's involvement, the CIA's involvement, the military's involvement. They show the photographs that were altered. They discuss how the body was, was altered and, and changed from one casket to the next. All kinds of details in it, and they do reach conclusions, which again Anthony Summers avoided doing. They project, as we've done in this show and the previous one, as to how it must have been done and who must have been involved. And they conclude, as we have, that, that the CIA uh, engineered the killing itself, the ambush, and the cover-up was the, the result of a broad uh, conspiracy, if you will, cooperation between the FBI and the military and the CIA and the Warren Commission uh, and the White House. They tend to, if you'll permit me, they tend to gild the Kennedys in a way that I would not do. They, they really idolize them and uh, attribute to them no evil and no remarkable weaknesses. And what, what role do they attribute to the mob in there? You didn't mention that analysis in the high treason book. It deals with the CIA's involvement and with the mob's involvement and shows the relationship between the two. And do they get that right? Because no one previously had explored the way that... Do they also go into the Operation Mongoose story? Yeah, they go into it, although... Yeah, they go into it convincingly. Mm -hmm. They could go into greater detail. They could explore it further, but they go into it and... Uh, it's it's a very convincing book, and I. Very, what what mm -hmm. do you think? Of there's it? a there's another book that ought to be mentioned, okay. uh, and that's John Davis's book uh, called Mafia Kingfish, right. uh, and it concerns Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans right. mafia chieftain, and and uh, takes uh, the same position as Shyam to some extent, but uh, more. More detail, more evidence, and very convincing in that area. High treason. Robert Groden, it ought to be made known, uh, he is the same Robert Groden that uh, did all of the fine work on the Abraham Zapruder film, the original optically enhanced, and, mm. and had the intestinal fortitude to, uh, to get on the Geraldo Rivera show and show it on national television under threat of lawsuit mm -hmm. and everything else you can think of and uh, showed it to the American people and was a, a great boost to uh, you know the American public's awareness of what was going on here. To what extent does it correspond with your own research? Do I you would have point a slightly out different take on this? No, I would yeah. point out that, that he, he brings out some new evidence mm -hmm. uh, in it he uh, he's one of the first to publish, by the way, the new best evidence book as well as his, 
publishes for the first time the uh, black and white photographs of the president's autopsy. Now, a lot of people are going to cry, oh, that's just terrible to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, the only reason it's done, the only reason it's done is because what the evidence shows from those autopsy photographs makes a liar out of the previous investigations one more time. You should show the viewers the J. Edgar Hoover book, Secrecy and Power. Oh. It's a book that's excellent. It's, it's restrained. It, they pull their punches. They don't talk about the fact that J. Edgar Hoover stole a million dollars from the American taxpayer. He was a thief. But they do make it clear, and you read that in conjunction with the contract on America, and you get the extent to which the Mafia is involved with our leaders. J. Edgar Hoover, a lifetime involvement with organized crime while deny, denying that it existed in the United States. Uh, and Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon's involvement with organized crime. And even uh, the Kennedy's sort of alter ego involvement with them, although they were, they were after them, they also had uh, involvements with them. Uh, sharing mistresses. Uh, sharing mistresses, uh, for example. Gary, we've seen on TV um, Uncle Walter Cronkite on PBS coming out with a program that was an absolute whitewash of the Warren Commission, and they didn't look at anything else. They just tried to make it appear credible. And then the Jack Anderson had a rather strange thing where he said it was Castro who did it, and the reason they did the cover-up was because if, if the American people knew that it was Castro, that they would have been uh, aroused and up in arms, and they would have won the United States to invade and destroy Cuba, and then that would have brought to Russia into the war, and then we'd had World War III. Did you see these two? This, uh, yes, and of course that's not new that's to us. It's been... Uh, one of the one of the things that's been put forth for uh, for a number of years, I reject it just for the simple fact that uh, number one, I don't think we were anywhere near that, uh, and uh, there there could never have been a time that I think that Castro would have felt comfortable in killing the president of the United States, and uh, so I reject that, and and I certainly don't think that. There was enough to that for for him to have the power, or his causing that to be done, and there he have the power to cover up or cause to have the cover up perpetrated for all of these years. Gary, yeah, getting back to this high treason, do they speculate there on who the actual hit team was to the extent that uh, you do, where you point to some of the people that could have been actually involved in the assassination? Do they go that far? No, they do not, uh, and. Uh, uh, you know, and when we point to some of the people, it, uh, we point to them because we have evidence that causes us to point right. to those. Uh, for instance, on our last show that we did together, we, uh, we looked at uh, a man by the name of Charles Harrelson, right. who's a well-known assassin, hit man, and who had uh, already confessed to, to uh, not only killing a federal judge in San Antonio, Texas, but also he said at the same time, I also killed President Kennedy. Uh, others have confirmed the fact that he was not lying and that he has been for a number of years, even as a young man, he was about 25 in 1963, even as a young man, one of the top qualified assassins in the United States. So I don't find it unusual and uh, if a guy says he does, uh, you know, does something, I think it ought to be looked at. The media <laughs> yeah. said, uh, so what? Ho hum. And there's uh, evidence that he was in Dallas. Well, there is some evidence in that we have photographs of, of, of some people being arrested, and one of them is the uh, uh, spitting image of the man. In fact, we've, we've shown photographs of, of him and of the, the man being arrested and uh, to uh, two independent forensic anthropologists, people who testify, doctors who testify uh, in court on, on matters of facial resemblance. And they said that there was a 90 to 95% probability that the two men are one and the same. So you have one of the most detailed accounts of the Kennedy assassination, yet did any of the media call on you during the, the 25 anniversary celebrations last uh, fall? 
I didn't see you on the... Con constantly, yeah. but I, I got cut. <laughs> yeah. So you were actually I, I, interviewed. I got the cutting room floor most of the uh -huh. time. In the uh, about three and a half minutes we have left, it's not much to make time to make a conclusion, but uh, the uh, satirist Paul Krasner said, uh, we saw him say that, well, we've had all these political assassinations, and the survivors now say they have a mandate. <laughs> but Kennedy, of course, wasn't the last political assassination. You had Karen Silkwood, you had uh, uh, RFK, Bobby Kennedy, you had uh, attempt to kill George Wallace, and Martin Luther King was assassinated. So it appears that uh, political assassination has been alive and well in the United States and apparently the people saw that they could get away with this and other either that this group that did this conspiracy or other people say hey it works and we can get away with it why not do it Gary okay. do you see this Kennedy assassination as a coup d'etat as one of the books on the subject indicates it was an attempt by a small group of people literally to seize power because they weren't in agreement with the direction that Kennedy was moving. I definitely do, and I think you can look at history and it'll bear that out. Uh, the, the policies that uh, President Kennedy was moving toward and putting into operation uh, started uh, changing that almost that very day, and uh, we were never the same. And going back to that day, it will be like turning a page in history. To his story. I think they're already seeing that. You know, one of these days I hope we'll learn the history lesson that this is saying to us. They did do it in 1963. They did cover it up. And when I say they, I wish I knew all of the particulars involved. We don't yet. And, uh, but they have continued to sell it to us until the people today say, what's the use? What can we do about it? We're just one, or we're just 10, or we're just 25. Uh, I would urge you to say, you know, we're still a very viable force in this country when we ri rise up and, and speak and uh, say we want something done. We're not through with this. And uh, one of these days, history will confirm that uh, President John F. Kennedy was killed by a conspiracy uh, founded within his own government, uh, but the perpetrators, after a long period of time, were finally convicted and brought to justice. What, in a couple of minutes or so, uh, would you evaluate this whole situation of political assassination? Just to simplify the whole thing, in all of my readings about the CIA secret wars and activities, certainly the, the thing that gives you the, the bottom line of the cynicism is the Kennedy killing that they would engineer a killing because they're not content with the electoral process and assassinate our president and stuff it down the public's throat, the cover story, and get by with it so that no one is prosecuted. The cynicism of doing this in broad daylight in front of the eyes of the world, if you will, pretty much says it all, doesn't it?